Welcome. Big Apple Film Festival conferences, agents and managers trying to navigate the world of representation. And we have with us Roy Ashton. And Roy is a partner with the Gersh Agency. Uh, so uh, thank you so much, Roy, for, for being here. Really appreciate it. Absolutely. And, My pleasure. Uh, cool. We're going to, I have everybody's synopsis and log lines of their projects. So I'll, I'll forward that off to you later. And that'd be great. Thank you. Awesome. I have pre-selected the questions and uh, trying to combine numerous questions into one so we can try to get to as many as possible here. Uh, so let me first begin by asking you if you could tell us a bit about yourself, your background, uh, yeah. a bit about the Gersh Agency. So my background uh, is pretty simple. Uh, I've been in the agency business for 22 years, which is when I got in the business in 1998. Uh, I knocked on the door of, of CAA, William Morris, and ICM. They're, they were the three biggest agencies at the time and dropped off my resume. No one called me. Uh, I knew one person in town, my cousin, who's a publicist. Uh, and she said for me to go to a guy who, who's a, a placement agency, like a headhunter. And I went there. He hooked me up with creative artist agency, CAA. And uh, they got me an interview with Human Resources, went in, started there as an assistant in the television department. Then I went to the mailroom and then I came back up, was an assistant again, was the television coordinator and then an agent. I was at CA for 14 years. And then I came over to Gersh uh, almost nine years ago now. It was about eight and a half years ago uh, to, to run the department as a partner in the company. Uh, and very simply put, the Gersh agency is one of the top five agencies in the business. Um, and they've been around since, uh, Gersh has been around since 1949, uh, has a very storied history. It started mostly as an actor's agency, still today, the number one actor's agency in television. Um, and uh, it's a great place, uh, you know, for, for me, but it's also a better place for clients because it's a client-centric agency. And that'll probably come up later. What I mean by that is, you know, that these agencies are so big, sometimes they People get lost in the shuffle. The Gersh Agency is, is uh, we're, we're over a hundred agents, but yet we have a very client-centric approach, which is very important in this business, which is a gigantic business and, and it's easy to get lost. Right, uh, most certainly. And I, I just, I guess the best way to start is with the question that yeah. uh, it seems most people have. Uh, so uh, it has to do with how to go about a approaching an agent. How do you go about uh, approaching an agency? Um, is it best to cold call, a query letter? Um, what are some, some ideas? So uh, it's, it's and, and what I said, the reason why I brought up the fact that I dropped my resume off at three agencies and no one called me and then you have to find the back door in. Uh, that's what you have to do finding an agent. If, if people cold called me uh, when I was a young agent in my first two years, maybe I'll respond if, if their email is interesting or if they've won an award, if uh, uh, back when I was an assistant, it was the Nichols Award, which was the big one. Uh, the Austin TV Festival was big. North Fork uh, is something that that has grown recently a little bit. Um, but it's just super hard. We have clients, we're super busy. And if you're sending a query letter, it's probably not going to get noticed. Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, if you have a spec script you want to sell, whether it's TV or features, I would call production companies and see if a young, a CE, a creative exec, uh, or even an assistant, you know, they're all, they're all pretty good. They're all knowledgeable. They know what their companies, their bosses are looking for. Uh, try that route. The second you have a production company or a producer interested in your material, I think you're going to get noticed. The other thing that's a huge thing now uh, is the, the writer's programs and everyone has them and you can find them out online, but Disney, Viacom, Warner Brothers, uh, they all have NBC. They all have great writer's programs. Uh, and that's, those are things you should definitely pay attention to. There are also director's programs. Sony has a great director's program. Uh, and, and, and there's a lot of diversity programs as well. So you should check them all out. And those, those programs, but you are, just got to keep knocking is the bottom line. It, it, there's no right. There's no path. There's no one way to do it. Right. And th those writers programs, are those more or less mentorship programs where they sort of help you to secure a, a, a staff writing position or, or sell a spec script? That's exactly what they are. Uh, the way they work is you apply. They usually, they're coming up now. I think the most of the deadlines are June and July. So if you're interested, check those out now uh, mm -hmm. because I think it's the right time of year. What they do is at, at Warner Brothers, which is, is uh, most of the ones are modeled after, but they, uh, you have an executive as your mentor. Uh, one of the current executives usually is who it is. Uh, they actually have a dedicated executive at each place that runs these things. 
uh, and they mentor you. They tell you what to write. Uh, there are classroom sort of workshop type of things and you work on the material that you're gonna write. They actually tell you that they prefer you not to have an agent. And then through the process, they introduce you to executives. So most of the time, there are executives on the lot. So at Warner Brothers, it would be someone from John Wells's company, someone from J.J. Abrams's company, for instance, you'd have meetings. You'd also have meetings with showrunners and you'd probably have like a group discussion with a showrunner. And these programs are not big. I, I think they're less than 20 people in each of them. I think it's 10 or 12 or 14 people in each. And Warner Brothers, the, the idea is that they place you onto shows. So these are really good programs. And you have to apply. You have to go through a. I oh yeah, it's a rigorous. Uh, yeah. Sure, it's a, it's like getting into college. I mean, it's yeah. it's you know maybe not that bad, but it's it's there are a lot of people applying. Right. Um, so if if you are, if a writer is working in fiction and film and owns the IP for a film TV script that they write, uh, what do you recommend as a strategy for getting published and and produced? Uh, a, 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 I'm trying. Sorry, I'm trying to read this getting published and produced a publishing agent first or a literate, is it best to get an agent first or a manager? I'm assuming that's Okay. Right. So very yeah. important here because a lot of times people will write a screenplay. Um, this happens in the feature world. It doesn't really happen in the TV world, but they'll write a screenplay, a movie based on a book or a property, an old movie. They'll write a reboot. They'll write an adaptation of a novel. Never do that. Um, you, 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 first of all, you may not have the rights. Most of the time you won't. Uh, unless you want to use it just as a writing sample. And if you do, then fine. It's just a writing sample. You're not going to be able to sell it most likely. But if you control the IP, then that's a different story. And if you control the IP, I still wouldn't recommend writing it. I would recommend talking to people about the IP, talking to producers, talking to agents. Uh, it just depends what kind of IP you, you, you have. Um, but you want to talk to people and develop the IP and then Obviously, you control it. So at the end of the day, you can say to somebody, look, I'm going to write this. And if you don't like that, then I'm going to go find another producing partner. And, it, you know, if you control the IP, you can do what you want in that space. Gotcha. Um, and when you're when you're first deter when you when you're determining um, about when you're making a decision about whether or not to take on a new client, what are the most important things you, you consider when deciding whether to represent let's say a showrunner or a screenwriter or a director with, with very limited experience? It's all about the material at the end of the day. That material has to be on the page. Um, so make sure your material is in good shape. Make sure it's the best that you can make it. Um, you can have friends read it or people in the business. And you know, a lot of times they're a little nice and they're not going to give you the real you know, feedback, they're going to tell you your script is probably better than it is. It's just natural. That's what, that's what happens a lot. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, some people will give you good notes and, you know, you should listen to them and then decide what you want to do. But at the end of the day, for us, it's, it's about referrals. We don't really take people that are, you know, uh, just, you know, again, cold calling us or sending us emails. And if you are going to do something like that, it better be something super interesting because, we just have too much on our plate. We have commitments to our existing clients. It's just, it's really hard to take on new, a new person. Also, I'm, I've been doing this a while. Uh, most of my clients are mid to upper level. So it's rare that I take on someone at a lower level, but even the lower level agents, the newer agents, younger agents, they're still overwhelmed and busy. Uh, so it's hard to stand out in the crowd. I, I would say referrals are the number one thing. And then ultimately meeting somebody, getting mm -hmm. to know them, seeing how they are in a room, seeing how much they know about the business. And then the most important is the material. Yeah. So if, if, if majority of agencies like yourself um, generally will not look at cold queries, what are some other options? Like, do you look at screenplay competitions? Do you look at the blacklist or cover Yeah, five? absolutely. Yeah. You know? Look, the blacklist is a big thing. Yeah. Um, the competitions are a big things. The graduate schools are a big thing. We all take a look at the graduates, uh, you know, the films, certainly the actors. We have a big New York office. They go to the Juilliard, you know, and NYU acting uh, performances at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. So there's no, again, there's no way to do it. Again, if you have, someone came to me with, uh, they convinced um, the estate to give them the Orson Welles uh, project um, that he tried to write for TV mm -hmm. uh, based on the movie. Um, and you know, at, at the end of the day, that's something I'm going to listen to because I want to know how you got the rights, uh, to citizen Kane. Mm. Um, but also I didn't know that in 
1956 and 1978, uh, Orson Welles tried to sell it as a TV show, wanted to sell it as a TV show, and you you got his his notes from the estate. That's interesting. It's worth the conversation. You're going to get a call back on that. Um, but again, know what you're dealing with. And, and if you have a screenplay that's really a personal screenplay, um, which is an important thing, that's great that you're writing that. And that's what the networks are buying a lot of times is that writer personal experience. That's not always a way to get an agent's attention. It, it just isn't. Um, again, it can be. There are no rules, but it's very hard to do that. So I would try and target, um, you know, if you have a family show and it's a comedy for a TV show, you know, ABC is, is you know, the, the network that does that. So look at what people have deals at ABC, who the producers are at ABC, and try and reach out to them and tell them you have a family show. And, you know, look, you knock on enough doors, you're going to get some, some openings. The other way to do it is, um, is what I did. I didn't know that I wanted to be an agent. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I just knew I wanted to be in the entertainment business. I got a job at an agency. So you guys can all get jobs somewhere uh, and, and figure out the business from there. And that's, a, that's another very good way to, um, to do it. In fact, um, the, the agent, uh, he's now a writer, but the person, my agent, uh, my boss at the time uh, for my first job, the person that took over for me was a writer and always wanted to be a writer. He was right out of school. And I said to him, trust me, one year doing this, you're going to have a leg up on the business. That's what he did. He's never stopped working 20 years now. Wow. And so, you know, what, it's also, he's a very good writer. So, and he works very hard. So to his credit, but he figured out the business right away and he's represented by that agency. So, right. Um, yeah. And, and uh, you know, the, the organization that seems to come up a lot is, is Blacklist, but some people are also asking yeah. about things like, do you guys follow like Coverfly or Ink Tip, uh, Stage 32? You know, yeah, they, they, there, there, are, hmm. there are people. And by the way, you can call an agency and ask who the motion picture coordinator is and maybe they'll get you, you can get to read, you know, them. But you want to stand out. You want to have something. You want to show people that you've been, you know, banging on doors. Mm -hmm. And if you've been doing that, it's a lot easier to get someone's attention. So if you're on the blacklist, you're mm -hmm. going to get someone's attention right away. If you're on any of those other things, again, those are motion picture things. So in TV, we really don't pay attention to them uh, yeah. because agents agents read TV scripts. Uh, we read all of them that we work on, and we read all of them that we represent. So. Mm -hmm. It's different. It's different probably in the motion picture business. The group reads and coordinators are most of their job, I think, is, is reading and reporting back to the group uh, what's going on with each and every script that they cover. So, so um, yeah, I mean, so you generally speaking, agencies like yourself won't look at a cold, cold query, but if something maybe stands out a bit, it's on the blacklist. It's on, it's yeah, not a high ranking cover fly. It's won some screenplay competitions and that comes in. That may be at least something that you'll maybe be like, oh, all right. You know, maybe we'll take a look at it. Right. So it's some kind yeah, of. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, all right. So, and then I have a question here. What's the best way to find financing and production partners for a feature film that has potential for spinning off as a TV series? So um, uh, that's a, for a TV series? Yeah, a feature film that could be spun off into a TV series. Is there a way? Okay, okay. So, so here's the difference, the big difference between feature films and television. In, in feature films, you can find money, you can get a movie made. Lots of people have done it. There's 400 or so movies made every year in just the United States with independent money. Uh, most of that probably comes from producers and funds, but a lot of it comes from individuals. And so that's the feature film business. It can happen. And then you go sell a film at you know, one of the festivals, Telluride and, and the thousand other festivals that are out there, right? In television, you don't do that. And if you, if you bring money to the table in television, it means literally nothing. The reason for that is in the television business, the networks and the studios want to own everything. They don't care that you're going to pay for half of a TV show. It doesn't mean anything to them. In fact, it's so, uh, it's so much different that the majority of the major networks, the major networks are ABC, NBC, CBS, Fox, and CW. You know, the, the, they've been around forever. They're not the streamers. They're not the cable companies. Uh, they won't even put shows on the air that they don't own uh, because the, the money that they make is derived from the sales, the second sales after the network airing. So in other words, an NBC show may air on Netflix uh, most of the CW shows, you know, they gave away to Netflix, but now they're they're making some of those are, are big business for them as a second window. 
Uh, Mr. Robot has a second window on Amazon that's that's about the same price as the entire budget of the show. So in television, they have to own everything. Uh, otherwise, they're not going to do the show. And that includes uh, literally every player, every major player in the television business. Uh, speaking of the streaming platforms, with so many streaming platforms around now, are studios um, still interested even in looking at spec scripts or are they only want existing IP? Uh, good question. They're, they're, they're interested in both, but IP is what's selling. I think, I forget what the number is, but the majority of TV shows are based on IP, whether that IP is a, a rebooted show. Um, just look at CBS, for instance, and literally three quarters of the schedule is old shows. Yeah. Um, Hawaii Five-0, MacGyver, they're, they're all over there. Um, you know, it, IP is the most important thing because, you know, that's, that's just, you know, books or, or formats from other countries. You know, uh, the new Brian Cranston series at Showtime is based on an Israeli show. There's so many shows uh, that are based on other shows around. And it really is comfort for the buyers. That's what they want. They want a proven show somewhere else. They want a book that sold a lot of copies somewhere, whether it's the United States, around the world, all of it. So the main thing is to have an IP. If you have a spec script, you better put elements on it. So you better add a showrunner, a director, an actor, all of it. Uh, it's very hard to sell a spec script. It's, it's possible, of course, but it, it is very difficult. If you do have a spec script, is there a way to get in front of a streaming service like a Netflix or a Hulu or something like that without representation? Is there any way to even? Yeah, you yeah. can go right to the producers that have deals there. You can just Google, you know, who's in a Netflix deal. And our former president is in a Netflix deal, Barack Obama and his company. And, you know, Patty Jenkins, who's a brilliant director. She just made a, a Netflix deal. Shonda Rhimes, Ryan Murphy, we all know. So you can reach out to one of those companies and figure it out. They're all you know, the internet is a wonderful thing to be able to, to research and, and locate people. So, you know, if one of them says, yes, yeah, you don't need representation. What I would say is you want representation at that point, because, and this is where we do get a lot of queries. Uh, if, if there's a deal to be made, you definitely want someone who knows what they're doing to make your deal. Uh, because, you know, you don't want to be in a situation where you're being paid, you know, $10 and it's your show, your idea, your script. Um, and obviously that's, I'm exaggerating there, but the point is, you know, you could get really um, put out of place on a deal and get shortchanged on a deal if you don't have someone who knows what they're doing helping you. We, we had a couple of questions about the global market um, in terms of uh, the American TV market within, within the, uh, the, you know, selling it to global markets. Uh, what are the opportunities like? Are there more opportunities overseas now, less? That's a good question. I mean, it's really hard to go to another country for an American writer to sell a show. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's very challenging and you definitely need partners for that. Um, the other thing is, is that the, the American market relies so much on the big, you know, six, eight, ten million dollar shows that, that we do here to be sold to these other countries, right? And television has become such a big business globally in the last 10 years that Netflix and Amazon and Apple are all fighting a streaming war as long as well as the local streaming outfits. And it's very hard to get noticed in those places uh, as an American because those places want authentic local show ideas. They don't want to hear from Americans. And obviously the majority of the world doesn't speak English. So look, we have clients that I have one client from India. Um, you know, he lives here, he went to college here, but he's fully culturally Indian, speaks Hindi. He sold the show in India, but that's a very different thing. Um, I would say you have to also be successful here and have some traction here before you start thinking about the global market. Interesting. Okay. And uh, we have, uh, so we have a writer here who was working shop workshopping the script at Sundance. Um, I'm assuming it's through the Sundance Institute and it was going to be pr uh, produced, but then it was not, it was passed on to some others and it was still not produced. Um, so, it, you know, so it, it, it's now sort of, I guess, still in this development stage. Where's the next step from here? Is there, is there another something else that this? And it's a screenplay or a TV pilot. Uh, it was a script. It was workshop that Sundance an independent producer was going to make it. They couldn't raise the money. So where does this writer now go from here? I I think uh, you then pound the pavement to find another like-minded producer. Uh, maybe someone who does this kind of a, a movie, does this kind of a, or a director company, 
you know, director companies that a director driven company that has a deal. And you, you keep banging on doors and just say, look, this is a Sundance developed screenplay um, with the financing fell apart. You know, here's what it's about. And, you know, are you interested in having a conversation? Mm -hmm. um, you know, again, you, you have to pound the pavement a little bit, no matter what you're doing. Um, you know, even producers who were big feature producers 10, 20 years ago, they're now, you know, desperately trying to get books or IP or something to put together movies. And, and it's a very difficult business, no matter what level you're at. Right. Um, there was a question about well, a few questions about when is the right time to approach a manager or an agent? Uh, let's say you're creating a series. Do you need to have numerous episodes written, a pilot shot already, um, uh, you know, a, a pitch deck? When, when is the best point to approach? So you can't have a pilot shot unless you're a filmmaker and you're going to make a short and that short is what you're basing a concept on. Mm -hmm. What I mean by that, you know, is from a short film, you can get signed by an agency, right? So like I know multiple people that coming out of AFI or other schools, they get, they do their short film and that becomes the, you know, what their manager or agent, you know, sends out to the world mm -hmm. and they can, they can be, you know, your calling card. That's fine. It's, and some of these shorts are brilliant and a lot of them are brilliant. And the other side of it though, is that whatever material you have and you, the more material you have, the better, right? Um, because writers can be as eclectic as they want to be. You don't have to be a certain kind of writer. You can write your way. You can write a comedy, a drama. You can write a, you know, anything, a screenplay. You can write both TV, film, novels, whatever you want. So the more you have, the better. But I would say that, you know, you, you really have to, um, you know, have a plan for the story. And so if you are having a screenplay, it's, it's easy. It's a, a two, two and a half, three hour, whatever it is, idea, you know, beginning, middle and end. In television, it's a lot more complicated than that. Character is the most important thing and, and building characters. And then it's about the storytelling and the ongoing mm -hmm. uh, idea and the, the longevity of that story because you're gonna have to make at least 30 or 40 or 50 episodes. So you have to have that kind of a plan. And for TV, it's, it's a good idea to have a plan for season one, uh, at least for the characters, but probably for the, for the show itself. So is it- Or is longer. It is it necessary to have like uh, what they call a Bible, uh, show Bible, so to speak, when trying to pitch it or to get financing? I, I think it's a very good idea. Um, and we're talking TV again, right? Yeah. Um, it's a very good idea to have a Bible. It is. Okay. With your script or have a Bible even before you have your script. I would assume that most of you need the writing sample. So that's why you're doing the script as well as to sell it. But then you know, sometimes they'll, you know, you can use the script to attach elements, which is the most important thing because a director needs to read a script mm -hmm. and, and an actor needs to read a script. Otherwise they're not technically attached, right? They'll, they'll, you know, they'll say, okay, I'll go out and sell this with you. But at the end of the day, when you write the script six months later, you know, see, uh, I'm not, I'm not doing this and that's their right. And that's fine. At least you sold it. You got paid to write a script, but they're not going to be attached. So if you have a script and you really want to sell the TV show, you should probably do a Bible. Okay. And, if or, or, and, and it's a treatment. It, it's any, and there's no rules to Bibles and there's things floating around the internet, like the game of Thrones. Uh, they wrote an eight or 10 page letter to the head of drama at HBO, why they need to pick up the show. Um, you know, Veep, um, uh, uh, the uh, haunting of Hill house, the stranger things, all of these Bibles are out there on the internet. You can find them. Mm -hmm. um, and they gave, they give you an idea of what people put together and every one of them is different. There is no set rule for what those things look like. It's whatever you want. Okay. And a few people had asked, uh, if you want to try to approach a certain director or a certain producer, or perhaps a certain actor to attach to your project, what's the best way to, to go about doing that? Well, if they have a deal and they have a production company, right? So if you want to attach again, Patty Jenkins, she has a deal at Netflix. She has a person that, that works there for her. I would reach out to that person. That's the best way. You're never going to get anybody's attention going through an agency. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and a manager, I think is even as hard, almost as hard. Mm -hmm. um, so it's best if they have a, a person, a development person, and most of them do. The successful ones, almost all of them do. 
Right, right. And and if you do try to approach a certain actor, let's say, or a producer or a director, uh, will it usually get to them if you go through their their rep? I mean, the, the problem with an actor is that they're not going to attach to a, a young person or, or an emerging person's script without knowing who the director is or the producer. So I would go to the actor once you found your producing partner or your director or showrunner. Okay. You know, in the movies, it's producer, director, and TV, it's that and the showrunner. Okay. And in, in terms of, you know, sort of standing out from the crowd a bit, you know, I know you don't often don't take cold queries, but like, for example, so there's someone on here now, they've already been a finalist in Project Greenlight. They've already been a finalist at Sundance. Uh, something like that, if they did send you a query, would that stand out? I mean, is that a query that you- Yeah, of course it would. It would stand yeah. out whether or not they, yeah. you know, and I'm, being honest, obviously on a personal level, like I, I go to a festival every year in New York uh, out on Long Island and I sit down with people and, you know, usually I'll, I'll read scripts beforehand or hear a pitch. Mm -hmm. um, I actually signed someone from one of these things that made a fi self-financed a TV pilot that was an hour long, it was brilliant. Mm -hmm. um, and he's a successful working writer almost right away from that, you know, from that uh, festival. Mm -hmm. And he was in his early thirties by then and, and a pretty savvy guy. Mm -hmm. um, but knew what he was doing. And, and you look at the material, it's fantastic. And then you, you know, you figure it out from there, but, but mm -hmm. look again, there's no, there's no, there is no rule. There is no, you know, for every person that's successful. And I could tell you stories like Brad Pitt was his first role in a movie with Thelma and Louise. And he was one of 400 people they auditioned for that role. And mm -hmm. when you think of who Brad Pitt is, you know, I mean, it's, it sounds ridiculous that he had to do that, but that's that's the reality. Yeah. Oh, by the way, some people ask what that festival is in Long Island. Are you allowed to say which one that is? Yeah, of course. It's the North Fork TV Festival, and it takes yeah. place in, in Greenport. Uh, yeah. Green Greenport, Long Island. North Fork. Yeah, that was I was going to say that's what I thought of, that's what I thought you were referring to. Yeah. Yeah. And and we um, it's a friend of mine who does it. That's why I'm involved, and and I got the agency to co-sponsor the festival and. And it's a great one. And you guys should all submit. The submissions are going out now. Submit to that and go out there. And by the way, those are events. You guys should be out at, at events. Any, and obviously with COVID, it's it's not really happening so much. They are doing North Fork, though. It's August 4th to 6th, which is a Wednesday to Friday. And just go out there and hang out and drive right. out. You know, stay, stay somewhere out of town because it's probably more expensive around the town. And it's hard to find a... Uh, a hotel or an Airbnb, but but go there and hang out for the day and night and, and meet people, talk to people. And those are great things to do. Yeah. So they're doing it in person, North Fork? As of now. Cool. Well, that's good. As of now, we'll see. Uh, right? Actually, one of the questions we had had to do with uh, how do you go about getting meetings now in this virtual age where we're not doing a whole lot of right. stuff? How, how do we, what are some strategies? It's all, it's all Zooms, just what we're doing now. We're, we're yeah. pitching and selling shows now and movies over Zoom. No one's in person. Right. I mean, people are now, I mean, now having lunches. I mean, some people, but generally speaking, they're not going to take pitches, people that they don't know. Mm -hmm. They're going to do that over Zoom, but that's what everybody's doing. Even, even there's no pitching in person right now. Right, right. Um, what, what do you think about uh, the future of the theaters? Do you think that's still going to be an option or you think we're pretty much going to be doing the streaming, the streaming thing from now, from now on? Theaters, I think, yeah. I mean, right now, I mean, in Florida and Texas and, you know, the red states are there, those theaters are open. Mm -hmm. I know California where I live is, I think we're going to 75% uh, either right now or next week. So I, I think we're fine. And mm -hmm. then apparently June 15th, all California restrictions are lifted. So mm -hmm. I, th I think we'll be okay pretty soon. The other thing is, is that you now have streamers. Um, and it's been an odd thing for the movie business to fight the streamers because maybe I'm biased because I'm a TV person, but I've always thought that you want to really want to make money in film. You really want to support the business when these movies come out, uh, put them on pay-per-view at 50 bucks or 75 bucks per movie mm -hmm. per household and see what you get. And maybe people invite friends over or not, but you know, depending on the movie, Top Gun's coming out. If I can't make it to the theater, I'm paying 75 bucks to see Top Gun just because I love it, right? So you might get two or three million people in the, in the country to do that. Think how much money that is. And I think that when you look at the gaming world and what they've accomplished, they now dwarf the movie business yeah. uh, probably five or six fold. Um, so the movie business, you know, 
the theaters are important and they're great and we all love going to the theater, but you know, it's really hard to, to say no to the kind of money that they could be getting for an event, a pay-per-view event. Look, I mean, look at sports boxing, figured it out. Look how much money these guys make. Yeah. I mean, um, Floyd Mayweather makes $300 million a fight. It's insane. <laughs> good, good for him. Yeah. <laughs> um, we had a question about how important is it to be in the U S to uh, be a screenwriter or filmmaker. Now um, he's asking, he's actually based in Australia and has actually sold some scripts to a Lionsgate aligned production company, sold four scripts in the family, family dramas. And uh, I'd like to know, you know, is it important to be in the U S in order to be doing this, especially during COVID times or does it not make a difference? Well, well, what's the, what's the living in Australia and what do you want to do? You want to, well, it says what? here, it says I've sold five family feature screenplays to a Lionsgate aligned production company. I am based in Australia, but I've never had management or an agent. Is there any advice you can give to someone in my position wanting to keep working in the family film market and how important is being based in the U S in COVID times? Well, in COVID times, uh, literally, there's no advantage other than the time zone. So, you know, I have a, a client that moved to Thailand, uh, and the biggest problem is it's 12 hours from Los Angeles, I think, or 11. And, um, you know, it, it's hard, but you can do it. And and I have clients in Australia. Um, I, I sold the Moody Christmas, which is on the Eric Fox. Um, you know, a couple of dramas I've sold. I, I know that market very well, have several clients. And I would say that if you want to be in the U.S. to open up your your options, because I think Australia is somewhat limited, um, and I'm doing something with the underbelly folks right now, um, you know, go to the Australian local folks. But but if they're not buying something that you have, reach out to your friends wherever you can. Um, but also your query email, if you're going to do one, says I'm a working Australian writer, and I can tell you right now look at the talent that comes out of Australia saying that you're a working Australian writer means something and right. people should pay attention to that. Someone, someone will definitely pay attention to that. Right. And um, you know, somebody asked if, uh, if they do have an opportunity to present a portfolio to an agent, uh, what should it be included in that portfolio? What should they have to show? I mean, I assume you mean multiple scripts, um, right. Or, or is it IP or both? Uh, it, it just says what in a portfolio, like what, what should be. In yeah. I mean, I mean, I, I would say, you know, your portfolio is probably a, a, a um, you know, a, a, a list of what you have. So if you have five scripts, you know, you should put a log line in what each script is. This is a half hour, you know, family comedy. This is a one hour, you know, uh, mafia world, you know, violent, you know, drama, whatever it is, and then say what you have and, and say what, you know, can I send you something to read? Um, again, it, it certainly shows, and it, by the way, if anything's set up or paid for, uh, you know, are there any attachments, say that, because that's, that'll get someone's attention as well. But yeah, present what you've been doing. I mean, look, I, I, I taught a class at USC and I, I wish I could continue doing it. I did it about eight years ago. And I love doing it just because it was a great thing. And I got to meet, you know, 20, you know, graduating seniors, um, all, of, all of whom are great people and hungry to, to work. Um, you can do something that the older generation can't. You can appeal and talk to the younger generation. Like they were all worried about how do I break in? Yeah, it's hard to break in. It's hard for anybody in any business you're working in. But you guys have something to say and you have a better chance of saying it to your own generation, your own, you know, group of, uh, you know, compatriots, so to speak. And what, what are, what are things that get you guys excited? You know, you, you know, better than we do. You know, sp yeah, speaking of, um, I guess the younger generation, one question had to do with, if you put a series on YouTube, let's say, or Vimeo or something like that, and it actually does well and builds an audience, uh, is that marketable to try to sell it to a mainstream network or a streaming platform? Absolutely. I mean, Quibi just went out of business. Roku bought everything they have. Um, if you, if you have something on film, you can try and sell it somewhere else, or it could just be your calling card to get in rooms and to, to get meetings and develop relationships with people. So, you know, any, anything there, there are no rules to any of this. And as long as you have good content, good material, whether it's a film or a script or even a Bible or an idea, you can get noticed, you know? Yeah. Um, and in, uh, hang on just one second, I just want to go back to hold on all right we had a 
We have a writer here. He said, I'm a writer producer with offices at Paramount. Uh, I'm looking for a rep because I'm pitching various companies. I just pitched Viacom. I'd like to know what projects you are looking for. Um, this, uh, this writer has worked for John Karras and Michael Islam from Batman um, and consulted for Sharp Entertainment. Anyway, yeah, so I'm just wondering, you know, um, what kind of projects Gersh is looking for right now? Anything specific or? So look, there, there's certain, and I'll speak to feature film for a second and then television. For television, well, feature film. So romantic comedies are back, right? So four quadrant never goes away. So, but, but the problem with four quadrant is there are these little people called Marvel uh, and DC, and they have opinions about their own IP and what they should be doing. And those studios are full up and they make you know 12 to 15 movies, whatever it is, depending on the year, um, you know, it's very hard to break into that world. You don't want to go into that space. Uh, you could, of course, anybody could, but very difficult. So the feature film business is a little more specific because there are just certain things that just wouldn't sell or wouldn't resonate. Um, in television, they're looking for everything, and there is a channel for everything. There are literally 25 scripted television channels out there right now. Right. Um, yeah. if, if someone is looking to sell, like a, with the rise of miniseries, how different is presenting packaging a miniseries versus a TV series or a movie when trying to attract an agent and industry professionals? How do these two strategies differ? Miniseries, series, movie? I mean, uh, you know, look, if, if, if you have a miniseries and, you know, Kevin Costner just did um, uh, Hatfields and McCoys and you have a Western miniseries and you want to present it to the guy that produced the Hatfields and McCoys, Leslie Greif, call them up and say, here's what I have. This is what it is. Do you want to play ball? And he ended up doing that to Texas Rangers, uh, a miniseries. It was supposed to be an ongoing series, but um, you know, target people and be specific. The more you know about them, the better you're going to sound when you're reaching out to them, right? The more informed you're going to sound. And a lot of it is, this is about you guys gathering information and being, um, you know, being, you know, prepared to have that conversation that you will likely get. You will have that moment, that conversation to be pushing someone's buttons, telling them what you have, telling them why they should read your script. You just want to be as prepared as possible for that moment. Uh, and there'll be many moments you, you will get there. Um, but it, it, there, there, there is no, you know, the miniseries business is challenging right now because they don't love doing them. They want to do ongoing series. Um, that being said, if you came up with the Hedy Lamar, who's a, a brilliant woman throughout history, married to a Nazi and then ended up, uh, you know, basically uh, going against the Nazis and helping the United States intelligence services at the time, create uh, the technology for radar and, and her, she had two patents, I think at the time, and it's still used today in cell phone technology. Um, and Gal Gadot ended up is, is gonna do it for Apple. If you, you know, that's something that if you knew the story of Hedy Lamar, which a few people really did, and you did your research, you're presenting someone with something that makes sense. The other thing is, is we're all aware that female forward and diverse uh, stories are, are what people want to buy now. They're a lot easier to sell, not a little bit, a lot. And that's another thing that feeds into that. This is a great woman in history that few people talk about. Let's see if we can do this. And at the very least, again, you're going to get that conversation because a lot of times in this business, people want to, um, you know, they want to hear what you have. They want to figure out what you're, you know, what you did all this research on Hedy Lamar. Well, let's sit down and talk about it. I love that idea. I love that story. I know a little, but not a lot. Um, there's also uh, someone else who's doing Marlena Dietrich right now. Again, similar, you know, another German woman from the same time period. And I think Kirsten Dunst is attached. So it just depends what you have and, and how you're approaching the market. But again, it all comes down to the work you do and how much thought and effort you put into these things. That's what you want people to recognize on top of the actual story. There, there were a few people just to go back to the whole pitch deck show Bible treatment that we're just asking if you could just briefly clarify like exactly what that should include. Like what's the difference between a pitch deck and a show Bible and a treatment? Like do those differ in any way or these? So yeah, and I, I'm happy to send you some if you want after this so you can distribute. But, yeah. but again, 
There are no rules. That's very important. There are no rules to that. It's whatever you want to get across, right? So I'll give you an example. So the, the, the Stranger Things show, they created a mood deck. It was, I think it was seven or eight pages. Maybe it was a little more. And on the front page, it was called Montauk, which is Montauk Long Island. If anybody knows Montauk, it's, it feels haunted. <laughs> um, and it, and when you drive through the center of Montauk, which is three blocks long, it's 1952 or 1953, not joking. It's beautiful. I love it. Um, most people do. Uh, anyway, the point is you, they created a mood with this. And part of that is exactly what the smart Bibles can be. That being said, the show Veep, which was entirely a mood, um, was just written type pages, seven or eight pages typed up, you know, about the show, maybe because it was sort of based on a movie, a British movie that they did. And if you watch the movie, you got the tone, um, you know, Game of Thrones, same thing. It was just a letter imploring them um, to pick it up. That being said, those were gigantic movie writers, guys that really knew what they were doing, that they trusted. So maybe you don't have to make the mood board the same way that the, the Stranger Things people did because they were not as well known. Right. But there are no rules. But just to help you guys out, I'll, I'll send you some and you can yeah. you guys can divvy them up. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, of it, course. It, when trying to gain representation, is it better to have optioned a script or say you have a shopping agreement, if you're familiar with a shopping agreement? Um, so shopping, I mean, what, what do you mean? Like if you're, if you have one of, one of your, you, you have an idea for a, a script you didn't write, you, you have an idea plan to make that movie and it's someone else's script you want to option or a piece of uh, IP? No, your own script. Um, it, let's say you've optioned it. Is it better to be able to say I've optioned my script when trying to get representation or to say I have a shop? Oh, well, someone else has optioned your script and yeah. that yeah. means <clears throat> someone's interested in being in business with you. So yeah. of course, Yes, it's better to get representation after you've done that because you're now in the business. You're now, someone has stepped up and said, I want to take a shot at this script and work with you and develop it. So you're in a perfect position to reach out for representation at that point. Gotcha. And uh, someone else here has a book that's doing really well with a top five publisher and has a literary book agent. So they've adapted the book into a pilot episode and seeking TV, TV and film representation for this particular IP but also other pilots in a feature that are ready. Uh, what's the best way to go about navigating this? So you have a top five book, help me out. So when you say top five, do you mean New York Times uh, so, bestseller? Oh, With a top five publisher. It's been published by a top, top five, five publisher. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, look, it, it just, that depends. That's good because again, you're in the business, you're active, you're doing something, you made a deal for a book and now you have a TV pilot based on that. I would say the query for that is, Here's what I have. I sold a book to publishing with Simon and Schuster, whoever it is, Penguin, whatever, um, a named publisher, which is good. Again, gets people's attention. And then I've adapted the pilot. Here's the idea for the show. Put a log line, two or three sentences for a log line explaining what, is, what it is. And if it's something that's interesting, they're probably going to say, send it. Right. It looks like it's from Harper Collins, I believe. That's my there you go. That's Check. a great. You know, <laughs> cool. Uh, there were also some questions about the importance of being in LA. Uh, is that necessary? Yeah, think? it is. Really? Okay. Period. Uh, end of story. And and the the reason is is because once COVID is over and and hopefully the world goes back to normal, you need to be around people who are in the business. You get those opportunities to go meet somebody. You you, you just. It's just different. You can't, it's a personal business. It's a human to human business. And again, going and getting a job in the business is critical. You can get a job in New York. You can get a job in Chicago. You can get a job in other places. I think Atlanta is pretty busy, but nothing compares to Los Angeles. Right. And uh, especially in TV and TV, nothing. There's no second that even New York, you can't. Right. Some people live, but they, they, they were 20 years working and then they moved to New York. Um, or even when they get a job, they have to come back and live in LA for the job or commute. It's, so it, it really is LA. Um, somebody asked about limited series. Um, is, is it more difficult to get a limited series such as like the Queen's Gamut or something like that? Is that more difficult to get greenlit than perhaps a traditional 
like a longer running series? It just, it just depends. I mean, the Queen's Gambit is Scott Frank, who did Godless for Netflix, and he's one of the most brilliant people in the whole entire world uh, in the entertainment business. And, you know, he can do what he wants. Uh, and Netflix, he has a relationship there, so he, he can do whatever he wants. Mm -hmm. um, I would say something, you know, it is harder to get a limited series, but if you have a great one, you can do it, um, you know. Yeah. All right. And uh, lastly, uh, what excites you most about a potential new show? If something's presented to you, what do you what do you, what excites you most? What are you looking for? Honestly, it's it's there's just it's a broad question. I, I understand the question, but um, you know, look, nobody, you know, Law and Order is one of the biggest shows in the history of TV. They didn't want it. Okay, mm -hmm. Survivor, they didn't want. Uh, American Idol, they didn't want. The Big Bang Theory, they shot it. It was a disaster. They redeveloped it the next year. Um, you know, it, it, the list goes on and on. No one wanted Seinfeld. No one wanted, um, you know, so many shows that are out there. Uh, no one wanted CSI. Um, so it, when you, you, what you want is someone who is prepared. Sorry, my phone is... Um, um, uh, a new landline. I never used one, and now I, I just put one in. Um, they, what you want, what you guys, in my opinion, should be focusing on as emerging folks is, um, you know, being as prepared as possible, as knowledgeable as possible, and as ready as possible to go in a room and knock someone's socks off. And I'll give you an example. So again, a show that no one wanted, and the guy at the network that ordered it got fired before it ever aired and lost. J.J. Uh, Abrams did it. J.J. Abrams was a pretty big guy at the time, but he wanted, he couldn't write it himself. He wanted to hire Damon Lindelof, who was nobody, a story editor, I think, which is uh, the second year of a TV show. And they didn't want, the network didn't want him. J.J. fought for him. Um, Damon got on J.J.'s radar because he wrote a 23-page play about a Jewish family in Berlin having a dinner party. Um, so right there, you know, it's insane. Um, it is on the internet somewhere. Um, because I know people that have found it, but I read that pilot and you just can't believe someone did this. It's actually on YouTube. Uh, they shot it. It's called, uh, Ali Klubberstorf versus the Nazis. And I don't think it came out as well. When you read that thing on the page, um, he was at my old agency. Uh, and at the time, right after lost, I remember sending that play to somebody that I was talking to, um, cause they'd asked me for the, the Walter Mitty movie that Jim Carrey was attached to at the time it ended up being ben stiller i sent that play in and lost wasn't quite the hit it was like the first year and they wanted to meet him they wanted to hire him to write the walter mitty you know the secret life of walter mitty um 23 pitch play and and actually the person at paramount at the time that said that she said to me he should shoot that and make a movie out of that because it could be he could get directing opportunities and writing opportunities in the feature film business based on a short so look it's all about you guys have more technology than Damon Lindelof and everyone before you had. Um, I've seen, I know a woman who made a movie for $600. I'm not joking. And she sold it to HBO for hundred thousand dollars at 23 years old. Um, yeah. Well, she called in a lot of favors, had her parents as the lighting crew, but still, you know, and her, I think her father was the caterer as well, which means he had the refrigerator in the house that they were in. But the point is, you, you just don't know, like, keep doing what you're doing, keep telling stories, you know, have an opinion, go watch TV, go watch movies, all of it's relevant, all of it's necessary. There are 500 TV shows out there. And if you're going to be in the TV business, you need to know what those TV shows are about and what they're buying, you know, and Netflix is buying everything. Um, and the only thing they don't buy is things that, that, that overlap with the stuff that's already on the air. There's no mandate to what they do. You go over to you know something like a, an FX, we know what they do. They're gonna do that super edgy, violent, um, mm. you know, Sons of Anarchy or you know, something, or they're gonna do the wacky, big, gigantic you know, take on a very well-known movie, Fargo. And on the comedy side, they do sort of that super edgy comedy. So you know what these places kind of are and what they do, but at the same time, there are no rules for anything because most of the shows, you know, that have ever made it, people didn't see it coming. You know, they just didn't. They didn't know that, you know, no one knew Lost was going to be a big hit. They spent, they, they shot it as a two-hour movie just to try and make their money back. Right. And it ended up being a, a game-changing TV show. Right. 
All right. Well, uh, I want to thank you so much for your time. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, you know, I have the log lines of our participants, so I will forward yeah. that to you. And Absolutely. If, if anybody did want to attempt to query the Gersh agency, is there, yeah. any, is there anything on your website that offers that option or anything like that? No, because legally the website always says, uh, you know, we don't take unsolicited submissions and there are reasons for that because we get sued if, if someone, if we took a submission and then, you know, sold a show later or one of our clients sold a show. So the answer is no um, on the website. Um, but I would say, you know, for, we have coordinators, um, you know, maybe you and I can talk afterward and figure out a way to, to break through the ice and maybe you pick, you know, Mm -hmm. Some of them are, we figure out something, but, but, yeah. you know, that makes sense. Sounds good. Yeah. I'll, I'll send you over the, you know, the log lines and if anything, you know, piques your interest, you know, I'll be happy to provide contact. Absolutely. And okay. and thank you. Care. All right. Well, thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate it. And thank you all. To My pleasure. Thank you. And uh, we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Okay. Thank all you right. all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.